Mr. Mayor, we're live. Go ahead. Very good. Good evening, everybody. I will call to order the City Council Workshop for April 27th, 2020. Kristen Rush, if you'll do a roll call. Mayor Williams. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Miller. Here. Council Member Pfeiffer. Here. Council Member Ford. Here. Council Member Jones. Here. Council Member Marriott. Here. Council Member Simpson. Here. Very good. We're all present and accounted for remotely. I'll have uh, council members, if you would, mute and uh, put your hand up if you wish to be called on. Thank you. We have uh, need for, we have three different workshops. The first one is going to be on the Denver Tramway um, streetcar, the the 0.04 restoration site presentation. Mr. Devin? Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'll introduce this item and then I'll turn it over to our uh, team that's been working on the, uh, the restoration. Um, you know, to, to reiterate, we are committed to ensuring that the streetcar is restored and cited in the best possible uh, historical context. Uh, we have locations that we wanna share with you this morning, or I'm sorry, this after, uh, pardon me, this evening. Uh, and the um, lo location that, uh, well, I'll go, I'll let the, our team go through the, the, the different location options, but we're hoping we can get uh, pretty clear direction around where uh, the council would like us to work on locating and citing this uh, historical asset, uh, because it will enable us to keep moving this, this project forward. The, the restoration is nearing, and, and the one thing that we haven't done is made a really clear decision regarding the, um, uh, the location for the uh, streetcar. Bruce, you can move the next slide, please. Um, so we've brought uh, uh, our team, pretended uh, design group. Uh, they're gonna review the cost estimate for the site, site improvements and again, seek your concurrence on moving forward. And with that, I'll introduce Stephen Padilla, a grants administrator who did a great job working on the original um, uh, uh, original grant, and uh, um, I think Stephen's on, so I'll invite him to uh, make a few comments. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, Bruce, I think I was going to start a few slides down at slide five. Um, so, yeah, so here we go. Um, hi, my name is Stephen Padilla, and I'm the grants administrator for the city. I've been working on this project since I joined in 2015. Uh, this project actually initiated in 2013 with a small grant for a historic structure assessment for the streetcar. Um, that was through the State Historical Fund and was completed uh, by Gary Petrie, who is our current architect for the restoration project. Um, in 2017, we were awarded full funding for the restoration. And so over the next few slides, I'll be sharing some background information on the historical significance of the streetcar, progress on restoration, and some historic photos that'll demonstrate um, what it'll look like when it's finished. The streetcar is important because it served the city of Arvada for decades with uh, transit service to downtown Denver along Route 84, and it was also the last streetcar to run before the entire uh, tramway system was shut down. As far as we know, it's also the only streetcar left from the tramway system that's still in restorable condition anywhere. Um, next slide, please, Bruce. So the restoration of the trolley is currently underway. It's intended to restore the exterior and the interior to its 1940s to 1950 appearance. Partial restoration means that the car will look like it did at the time of its last run in July, 1950 but that it will not be operable. Uh, the interpretive display will have to include a protective structure over the top to protect from rain and sun damage to the roof. Um, and it should be done probably in a style that's consistent with our other parks and public amenities in Old Town. Next slide, please. 
The trolley was listed on the Colorado State Register of Historic Places in 2000 for its significance as the last known intact Denver Tramway streetcar and the last streetcar to run before the route ended in the system. So in order to maintain its status on the register, the final sighting and display of the trolley will have to be approved by the State Board prior to implementation. So if Council approves staff recommendations, we can then move forward with the application uh, to the State Board. However, I did um, seek preliminary feedback from them in order to make sure we're on the right track and they generally gave positive feedback. Um, they've said that the location we're presenting is good because it supports the integrity of location and setting because it's adjacent both to the current transit line, the G line, as well as the former Route 82 line. And they did advise that if we decide to do a shelter, it should be designed in a way that's more minimalist and doesn't attempt to sort of create a diorama effect or a historic setting that didn't actually exist. So they want it to kind of be in line with our existing park design and not a special sort of trolley setting. Um, next slide, please. So upon award of the grant funds in 2017-2018, the city assumed ownership of the streetcar from the Denver Tramway Heritage Society who had um, been keeping it in storage for over 15 years. We received $200,000 from the State Historical Fund, which is their maximum grant award for the restoration. The city has obligated an additional $265,000 to the streetcar um, for restoration as part of our total approved contract with Empire Carpentry and Wasatch Railroad contractors. Um, this, um, this total contract amount also includes the cost for relocating the trolley from Arvada to their facility in Cheyenne, Wyoming, as well as back to Arvada, wherever its final place will be. Um, at the present time, there's no obligated funding for the final site plan. There are some grant possibilities that are explored, but most of them we found so far are in a smaller dollar amount under 25,000. Of course, we will explore every possibility, but at this time we haven't identified any funders um, who could support a large percentage of the project. Next slide, please. This project is also supported by our community partners. The Arbata Historical Society has taken a strong advocacy role for this project over the last decade, and they're prepared to offer programming and volunteer support um, for the interpretive display for public benefit. Um, very important as well for this project's success is the Friends of the 04 Trolley Group. This is a group of 15 or so residents that have been meeting at least quarterly and often monthly for the last two years. They have actively advised and reviewed all of the potential site plans and they've held several fundraising events. They've attracted local press, uh, both on print and TV. They're a registered 501c3 and they're collecting donations for the site plan. Um, their president, Mr. Wally Wirt, originally saved the streetcar from destruction over 20 years ago and he's been advocating for this project this whole time. Um, next slide, please. Another key partner uh, that bears mention is Colorado Preservation Inc. In 2015, they listed the trolley on their most endangered places list, which lends credence to the importance to save the trolley and also attracted press at that time. Mr. Kim Grant represents Colorado Preservation Inc. on the Friends of the 04 Trolley Group, ensuring that we maintain the support of these key stakeholders for the project. Next slide, please. I'll do a little recap of the history for the 04 for those who aren't familiar or haven't heard in a while. So the Denver metro area once had an extensive electric rail transit system. It included over 250 miles of city tracks and 40 miles of inner urban lines. The line that connected Arvada and Golden to Denver was the Denver and Northwestern Railway. It um, transported people as well as coal from Leiden Rock and US mail. The Denver Tramway Company Streetcar 04, the one we have, it served Arvada, Golden, and the former city of Leiden. It was originally constructed in 1911 and was the very last car to operate in the streetcar system before it was shut down in 1950. It was in service on these lines for nearly 50 years and played an integral role in the develop, uh, development of Arvada as a commuter suburb. And in the winter time, before cars were commonly in use, it was often the only way people could reach downtown Denver through the snow. This car was, when it was decommissioned, was purchased by someone who allegedly used it as a cabin um, throughout the 1970s until it was purchased by Jack Forney, 
and relocated to the rear side of the Forney Museum's location at um, Platt Street, where the current REI flagship store is located. When Mr. Forney decided to relocate his museum, he was going to have um, the trolley demolished. And that's when Wally Wirt stepped in, who's, as I mentioned, the current president of the Friends of the 04. He acquired the trolley from Jack Forney and donated it to the Denver Tramway Heritage Society, as well as getting it listed on the state register. Um, and the Denver Tramway Society has been storing it since that time. Until we moved it to Wyoming, it had been in a lot on Tennyson Street here in Arvada. So we have a few more slides we're gonna go through that um, are just some photos. So we could go to the next one. So here's some pictures of the trolley in the 1940s, some good color photos. This one I believe shows it in golden and this is a pretty good representation of what we want it to look like when it's displayed somewhere in Old Town. We can go to the next one. Um, this is it traveling on its trip to Denver from Arvada. I don't know exactly where it is, but this is what it would have looked like on the inner urban line. You can go to the next one. Um, this top picture, I believe, was also taken in downtown Golden, and I'm not sure where this bridge is, but these are just some good photos. You could go to the next one. And here's a couple pictures that were taken during the last day of service. You can see this one here at the Arvada Junction. The sign on the front says goodbye old friends. So this was the very last run of any Denver tramway streetcar. And um, these are good pictures, both that kind of show what we want it to look like when it's finished and that can be displayed in interpretive signage at the final site plan with some information about all of this. Um, so we can go to the next slide now. So I'll conclude my portion of the slides with the summary of its current status at Wasatch Railroad Contractors in Wyoming. This picture was taken, um, I think about two weeks ago, they sent it to me and it shows how they're, um, they're starting reconstruction and they've fitted the windows. They you know, remanufactured the windows, which were mostly broken and had them fitted for the windowsills. So the disassembly for restoration and replacement is complete and reassembly has finally begun. So they took the trolley completely apart um, and it's now beginning to take shape as they put it back together. They um, refabricated windows, rebuilt the flooring and the floor joists. They also had to put considerable effort into stabilizing the two ends of the trolley that were more deteriorated than they realized and were starting to sag. The next step will be working on the doors, the roofing, the siding, and the interior finishes. And then they'll work on either procuring or fabricating facsimile components for the mechanical parts like um, uh, the brakes and you know the air compressor and those sort of things. The COVID-19 pandemic did slow down their work a little bit, but at the last conversation I had, they were expecting three or four more months for completion. So that'll put us at around the end of September, 2020. If our site plan is not ready for the trolley at that point, Wasatch Railroad contractors have said they can store it at their facility for a longer term um, for a fee that we can negotiate at that time. Um, and that's what I had for my slides. I'll stay for questions, but for now I'll turn it over to Bob. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Hi, this is Bob Corey with Bertina Design Group. Um, we're landscape architects, urban designers, planners, um, lo located in Denver, formerly Old Town, Arvada. What I was asked to do was to uh, study these two sides, one being the flour mill site and the second being Grandview Avenue. And um, what I've shown, what we're showing here is a, the way we analyzed the site was we looked at it, both of them from, a, from a displaying the trolley from access, visibility, for visitor security and for constructability. The trolley is going to be brought on a flatbed truck and in order to get the trolley in place, we're going to have to crane it into place. So um, studying this site, you can see in picture number one in the upper left, there's a few challenges with this site, uh, starting with the access back into the site. The way the semi uh, truck trailer and the crane will have to come into the site is probably from north of the um, 
water tower project across the fire lane across Wadsworth to have a straight shot into the site along the south edge. And the next slide will show a little bit more detail. But um, also in that upper left-hand corner slide, there's some electrical, there's three light poles, as well as the electrical cabinet that would have to be taken apart or, or disassembled temporarily to get um, this machinery back there. Bruce, do you mind uh, going to the next slide? So this slide shows the location of the trolley. The site that where there's room is to the east of the existing barn structure. This is, um, so in, in the black where the red arrow is, is the trailer, and then it would have a crane behind it or in front of it. But um, some of the challenges uh, with this site are the, the garage's retaining wall that was built with the transit garage. Um, I worked on, I was, we were the landscape architects on the, on the garage project. <clears throat> And I remember working, well, working with Bill Zietlow was the, he's the structural engineer. And I contacted him because this site at this end of the flour mill site gets really tight between 12 and 15 feet between the railing um, just south of, of the barn structure to the wall. Um, I'm talking with Bill, he and his letters included in the packet. But basically, there's some uh, concerns about the um, the weight of all this equipment, but more so the the crane. And when the outriggers uh, are down and you and they lift this trolley into place, there's there's uh, moments of of overturn and stress that. Um, uh, you know, was never designed in the wall to begin with. Whether it can handle it or not, we don't know. So, so there's the other thing about this too is that uh, just looking at it from a visibility and a display point of view, it's kind of tucked back in here. So when you're going down Wadsworth and even Grandview, you may get a slight glimpse of it, but it's behind a lot of different things in. Um, it doesn't feel like it may not be as prominent as it, it wants to be because of the historic nature and the restoration of the trolley and should be displayed in a way that's visible and easy, easily accessible, in my opinion. Um, Bruce, do you mind going to the next slide? And you can keep going to the grand view. You can keep Bob, before you do that, um, sure. on the on the east end of the transit plaza, would it not be possible to put it there? I know that I know that's RTD property, but have there been discussions with RTD and would they be open to it, or would it physically fit there? Um, you know, uh, Bruce, I'm sorry. Do you mind going back to that first slide I had up? You had up for me that one. You know, I'm not, uh, you know, Mark, I'm not really sure without taking a closer look. This trolley's what, 44 feet long with a cage on the front that's three or four feet long. So it takes up, you know, 50, close to 50 feet of length. And I'm, I'm not sure. I know we have that art feature at the foot of, um, of um, sorry, I drew. Right, we go to the east of the art feature is what I'm envisioning. Yeah, but yeah. I would I would like to at least get that measured and definitively tell me if it would physically fit or not there. Okay, we can do that because we wouldn't have the issues with the um, first of all getting now. First of all, I think we could probably get it there by helicopter, but uh, we probably don't want to do that. But uh, <laughs> it may be a little pricey. Um, okay, so if somebody could look at that, uh, Ms. Ford, you had your hand raised. 
yes, Bob, I had a question um, in terms of bringing the trolley to the current spot. Has anyone looked at the idea of, or is there enough room where one could bring in a low boy, take the trolley off the low boy on and, and wheel it onto the pad that would have the tracks on it? Has anyone looked at it as uh, instead of not bringing a um, crane, but just actually wheeling it right off of a low boy in this location the site mm -hmm. i'm not sure how you would do that because it's um just getting the getting it in place i'm not i'm not sure how that would work it's well pretty, um, well i also have another question in regards to that have we actually uh consulted with a a group that moves large equipment because um, sometimes they're able to do things that we don't imagine since we don't do that physically. Have we consulted with someone like that? Uh, not at this time. I, I would recommend that we do that. I would recommend that we talk to a consultant that actually moves heavy equipment and get their uh, opinion on this. Mr. Mr. Pfeiffer. Yeah, I agree with uh, Nancy on that as well. But uh, I, I was wondering, can't you just bring it on rail and have a rail crane move it over right on the BNSF? There's, there's no lines over it, right? So I don't know, did we even talk to, to them about just bringing it on rail right there, dropping it off? Anyways. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's something that could be looked at. I guess um, the other part that my concern was just the visibility and accessibility by visitors and that it's, again, it's kind of back in there and it's not as prominent, I don't think, I don't feel as it should be for the type of a uh, display. Yeah, and I and I I understand that. I, I think we just need to explore these options. And I also agree with the mayor that the eastern end of that plaza is not utilized. So I'm sure we could probably uh, secure a place to put that. It, that would probably be the ideal uh, location. So I just want to make sure we're we're exploring our options fully um, with some of these sites. Okay, Ms. Ford. My uh, another comment that I would like to make is, is that even though the trolley itself may not be as visible in that location, it does give us uh, some potential in terms of activating the mill. So if if this is an, a, a plan that we would like to have happen here in Arvada, and if the mill is more activated, you're going to have more people in that site and it will be seen from that perspective. It may not be great from the railroad, you know, being on the G line, but it will be visible if that mill is activated. Yeah, and I guess the other the other point was just the policing of it and you know kind of back in there a little bit. It's a little bit um maybe a little bit tougher to to secure it and to keep eyes on it. Yeah, I, I saw that in your report. My thought is there's a lot more people there by the transit hub and the and the um, plaza than there's going to be at the other proposed site. But let's go ahead and move to the other site and discuss it. I think there's before I'm going to totally give up on this, Mr. Devin. I at least want to get those things checked out. Sorry, but it, it, it's reminiscent for me of Mr. Koshin telling us there's no way we could get into Red Rocks Community College off of Kipling. Okay, let's look at the other one. Okay, Bruce, do you mind moving forward back to those? Thank you. So the so the, um, the Grandview site, I think it was in one of the reports as well. Um, 
So what we were looking at was the east side where there's a flat area. You can see in some of these photographs, it's very um, accessible from both a, a road perspective as well as a pedestrian perspective. And it's visible not only from Grandview and the transit, but it's also as you're heading south on Wadsworth bypass, it's uh, visible from there as well. Um, Bruce, do you mind the next slide, please? So the so the idea is that it would just sit in this this space here. And what we did, and on the next slide it shows it, if you don't mind, Bruce, is the next slide after that, please. Thank you. Is what we did was we what we really wanted to do was set this up so it's easily visible as an element that's almost not necessarily tied to the Grandview Bridge, but the Grandview Bridge has become such an iconic um, feature, I think, when you're driving and when you're visiting Arvada. People know it, uh, you know, whenever I say we're from Arvada and we talk about some of our projects and they say, oh yeah, I've been, I, you know, I've seen that bridge. This site plan sort of ties this trolley uh, as this is like an extension of that piece, but it's and displayed in such a way that it really fits into into the site site nicely. It parallels and relates to the the G line. It also there's opportunities for you know field trips and things like that for kids to just to use the lawn area. Um, this is uh, enclosed with a small fence and it would have a shade structure over it. That's kind of, we have two shade structures in here that we looked at, but um, so it's really nicely displayed, lit up, security, there would be security on it as well as the other site too. But um, it would also, uh, you know, it would be something that would be seen again from three different things, the train, the Grandview, and the bypass heading south. And so we put together, uh, I think the next slide is, uh, any, well, any comments? Okay, I've got uh, two people with hands up, uh, Nancy. Um, yes, I have a couple of comments. First of all, I'd like to say that um, I just received a text from Wally Wirt, and um, he suggested that we contact Disher Trucking. Uh, that was the firm that moved the trolley from the yard to Cheyenne, and they move lots of railroad equipment for many firms, he mentioned. So they may be a, an ideal company to, to talk to as far as the logistics of actually moving it near um, the um, uh, mill. The other thing that I would like to just say is, is that when I, two things, when I think of the bridge, I think of it as the view of the bridge from below, from, from car. And my main concern with this particular site is, is that it's far away from the main part of Old Town. I have been questioning, uh, asking myself, you know, what is going to compel people to walk down to this site, given uh, potentially future construction that's being planned in the area? Um, it's far away from the main part of Old Town, and I don't see the continuity. Uh, with this site. That's where I struggle with it. Um, those are my comments. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Simpson, you're next, and then <coughs> Mr. Marriott. 
Um, I actually uh, slightly disagree with Nancy. I like the Grandview site um, specifically because it is a little bit further down and it creates that uh, walkability and further attraction. It helps us extend the offerings that we have for Old Town as opposed to densifying everything in one location um, where most things already are. That said, I do also really like the platform idea right there by the train. So I think both options are fantastic. Mr. Marriott. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would agree with Lauren. I actually kind of prefer this Grandview site for a couple of reasons. One is that's actually the closest to the to where the trolley actually ran. You know, the trolley would have uh, kind of come up uh, where the Wadsworth Bypass is and turned and gone on the south side of the tracks, but towards the old town station platform. So physically, this is probably as close as we could get it to where it actually was. Um, so I like that. I also like having a, uh, an attraction or, or, or a public fixture on the east side of Old Town. I think it expands Old Town slightly and, and adds interest to the area. The other is, is that I worry, like with the flour mill now, that putting it behind the flour mill just allows it to be... Um, diluted because it's it's all just mixed in there with the flour mill you know every all of our historical assets are there in one one basket and two if that site were not actively um oh managed or programmed i just don't see it being much value there granted it would be visible for folks who are waiting to get on the g line but that's about the only place it'd be visible from and and uh if if we had a historical society who was really desiring to have it there and had all kinds of plans around programming uh, to include the trolley car and making that, you know, really a centerpiece of their offerings. That would be a little bit different. But in, in my whole time here, I, we, our historical society has never really chosen to function that way where they've really uh, been a, a programmer of, of historical assets in Old Town. They certainly own some and preserve them uh, but 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 as far as really getting them out forward into the into the public, I don't see that. And I think this site would this site here on Grandview would be just marvelous for for all those things. So for me, even if the the flour mill one were equally um, equally as uh, as as doable as this Grandview site, I think I would prefer the Grandview site anyway. Um, I think it's a better choice, better spot for it to be. Could I have Ms. Miller and Mr. Uh, Jones chime in? Um, I'll chime in. I, I like the I like this Grandview site. I was a little torn at first. I was thinking, you know, it'd be great to have it down there by the flour mill, but I I would tend to agree with with Ms. Ford and Mr. Marriott and Ms. Simpson on why it is good kind of on the other side of Grandview. So I like where that, uh, <clears throat> I like that proposal right there. And Ms. Miller? Hi, me too. I like the Grandview site. Okay. I would, uh, let me finish it out on this aspect of it um, that I would at least like our team to answer those remaining questions, particularly as to the possibility of, um, of putting it on, on the plaza itself, um, and then at least explore if there's other ways to move it on there without having to use cranes. Okay, I've got two. Mr. Pfeiffer, did you not get to chime in? Uh, no, I did. I just wanted to make sure, are we gonna talk about the dollars? Is that, are we, are we I just wanna make sure we're not wrapping up too soon. Yeah, no, I, we obviously right. have talked dollars. Good, thanks. And Ms. Fort? Um, I'd like to ask the question, if we ever approach Trammell Crow about their site, if there would be space on that site to put the trolley, I, I've never gotten an answer to that question. Uh, Nancy, I believe I have answered you, and I believe I told you that we have, and I believe I told you that it's not feasible um, from their standpoint. And what was the reason that they gave as being not feasible? It was uh, it was just not able to be accommodated on that hillside without a significant, very significant investment in retaining walls and construction. Um, and um, 
they were not interested in, in that. And frankly, neither were we when we looked at the scope of what would be required there. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that I think that is that's done. That's I don't think that's there's any way we can go back and look at that again. Okay, let's let's look at the last couple of slides with regard to the um, shade structure, and then talk costs a little bit. You know, this it, it's kind of interesting, and it's it's appropriate that we're continuing to discuss this project, even though we've got a lot more important things on our plate. This is only a, a workshop at this point. We're not making a decision tonight, but for me, it's it's like having something out there that's good. Uh, and to a true asset for our community and that we don't just stop doing good because we've got to do crisis stuff. So that would be my comment about why we're talking about this tonight. So Bob, if you want to run through the, the uh, shade structures. Bruce, do you mind? Okay, uh, here's cost estimates. Yeah, the cost estimate. Basically, this is obviously for the Grandview site where we took a look at generally what this would would run. And there's a range here because of, you know, there's some unknowns as well as some contingency that's, you know, enough to, to um, look for any possibility that there's, you know, there's issues or whatever. But this site um, I think is pretty clean as far as underground utilities not running through it, but I'm, you know, we worked on this a long time ago. So, but, uh, you know, as far as um, getting this in place, it's how, how much detail do you want in the display, the plaza, the fencing, you know, those kinds of things where there's maybe some flexibility and what we were trying to do was tie it to what's already been done on the bridge with some of the rail stuff on the south side of Grandview, where it's that ornamental rail system. We also um, uh, heard talk to Mike Moon this morning, and he sent over uh, some, there's fiber optics in this area that we could put some cameras that tie back to the city and to the police department with uh, you know, for, 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 um, you know, loudspeakers, people for vandal, vandalism and things like that to watch out for that. Um, Bruce, do you mind going to the next slide? So this, you know, has all the improvements on it, the way it, it today's, uh, just looking at it from a concept uh, perspective. And then the next, if anybody, I don't know if you have any questions or not, comments. Don't see any questions yet, but that could change. Mr. Pfeiffer, you wanting? Well, I want to come back to this, but we'll finish the presentation first because okay. it's funny. Okay, uh, Bruce, do you mind going to the next slide? So we did, these are um, two prefab structures. Uh, this thing is 50, no, I'm sorry, six. 60 feet long, around 60 feet long by uh, 18 feet wide, I think. And it's for the, the trolley is 12 and a half feet tall. So this thing is up 13 feet in the air. And then the second one has a little bit more detail to it. The next slide, Bruce, please. Has a little bit more detail to it and a little bit more character to it. And um, just two examples in the, we had them uh, price it out what it would be what it would cost to bring to the site and install, and um, those costs are in the cost estimate as well. That's why there's a range there. I think this either one um, again. I think uh, it'll be visible from all wads coming south, especially if this is nicely lit and uh, displayed nicely. It will. I think tie nicely with uh, with the bridge structure and some of the soft lighting that occurs there. Okay, it looks like you got one more slide. Okay, I'll open it up for council questions, 
discussion? Mr. Marriott? Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, you know, all along, um, we have been uh, had uh, been, this has been a difficult balance to balance the cost of something like this, along with the opportunity that we have here to truly protect something that's our uh, that's that's part of our heritage, kind of a one shot deal at, at, at doing something. And, you know, we've taken we've gone halfway there with the restoration of the trolley car and have gotten some help with grants to do it. Now we're down to the to the site part, which is the second half of it. And so um, I think we need to, to execute on this uh, second half of it. I think also Mr. Padilla will do uh, the best job he possibly can at, at acquiring us some more grants and some help with doing it. But I think it's important that we decide where it's going to be so that so things can move forward um, and we can go ahead and do it. I, I, we had a little discussion about the sites and and I'm fine with looking also at the south at the east end of the uh, uh, station platform. I, I think it's fine for us to consider that, but whatever we choose as a site, uh, I, I think we need to go ahead and choose that as a site and get moving. One of the things I would, I would love to see us do, uh, particularly in the, in the times we're in, if we can pick a site is, uh, whether our talented, uh, city teams can contribute in, in some way, as well as making some kind of opportunity for, our citizens to uh, to to participate, um, and certainly there's the friends of the O point oh four who are uh, once a site is selected can start raising money and having events, and the public can certainly participate that way. But I, I think making this a community project that brings us all together is an important part of this, and I think part of that community can be our uh, our city teams who have done some amazing stuff when we haven't had the opportunity to contract things out and. And I think looking at, at, at those as a way to both save costs, but also get community investment are also really good things. So I would encourage us to consider that site at the east end of the, uh, of, of the train platform. But if it's not possible for us to go ahead and, and move forward with this site on Grandview and, and get kind of get the plan in, in place. And I know right now the fiscal aspect of this is very tough given the the pred predictions of what we've got going forward, but we're already invested halfway and, and I just don't see how we can do anything except finish it out and, and finish it out really well. So those are my comments. Pfeiffer. Shocking, John, I'm surprised. We're over half a million dollars into this with grant money and then we're, gonna, we're okay with spending another, just as much as restoring it just for site. So you're looking at the high water mark at $530,000 over half a million dollars for a shade structure. So when I'm looking through this, I, I just want to encourage staff and Bob and your team or whatever is to look at this because I almost see half of it is just inflated costs like miscellaneous hardship or uh, hardscape improvements, miscellaneous improvements, miscellaneous improvements, contingency. That's a lot of money just quoted. So I hope we don't encourage that we just leave all this fat inside this um, uh, concept quote here, because uh, also looking at over $150,000 in security and contract mobilization. I mean, there's just some things in here that really worries me. I don't care if we were halfway. If I knew it was going to be over a million dollars to do this, that's not what we were sold on. I will tell you exactly the discussion was, is we'll put money in to get it restored and we'll do some sort of structure. Now, granted, the structure was never discussed as a half million dollar structure. It was discussed as a shade structure and maybe in a park. I just can't see at this time with, with the whole situation we're in, as well as tax revenues are going to go down and our street issues and everything else that we've been focusing on to be willy nilly okay with a half million dollar uh, just for a shade structure. Oh, Bob, that's not accurate. The structure, the shade structure itself is either 82.5 or yeah. 60,000. I, I get it. I get it. There's $20,000 for a security system, $20,000 for flowers. You know, there's, there's just, there, I get it. But if you look at the whole plan, the whole site plan is to take a structure of 80, 80, let's just say 60 to $82,000 
And then we're going to spend $400,000 making it pretty around it with grass and bushes and trees and a fence. So I, we need to be really just aware. This is not, you know, with all the other uh, obligations, I just don't, I didn't expect it to be a half a million dollar project uh, just, just for a structure and a park for it to sit in. So I'll leave it there. Ms. Simpson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. So I actually come in right between where uh, um, John and Bob are. I agree that we, absolutely that we are halfway in. We should finish this. It's going to be a valuable asset for the community that will continue long past the current economic crisis. And I really just want to expand upon the idea that John had about community involvement. Um, uh, this is something that kind of goes back to my own small town roots, uh, where everybody pitched in sort of with the barn raising on occasion it'd be an actual barn um and so what i was thinking was you know anything that has to do with safety issues such as the actual structure perhaps that obviously needs to be overseen by professional contractors but in terms of flowers and things like that anything where we can involve the community perhaps have a bit of a a small community pitch in project get the community gardens involved things like that um, that could be a really interesting way of getting both labor, supplies, uh, and uh, other things donated. Um, and it can be very successful as well as uh, really seeing community investment into the project skyrocket because the people feel like they had a hand in it. And so obviously that doesn't have to be decided on right now, but it's an idea that's worth exploring that can both save costs as well as make this truly a community project for the benefit of Arvada. Ms. Ford. Ms. Ford. Well, I was going to say exactly what um, Ms. Simpson said, because uh, I've been uh, very fortunate since I'm on the uh, Friends of the Point of Four Trolley Committee. I'm their treasurer, and I've been involved in a number of the fundraising uh, fundraising for it. People are excited about the trolley. This is history for Arvada. And you talk to a lot of people in Arvada and they feel that we're losing much of our history. We've committed to this project. Once we establish the location, the friends are very excited to do fundraising. We believe that there are organizations out there that love old trains that will be supportive of it. I completely agree with uh, Ms. Simpson about we have an excellent uh, Arvada gardeners. Surely they could do something beautiful and to help. Um, and I think that especially at this time, we need something like this for our community, something that people can get behind, be excited and, uh, and just feel like they're a part of it. So I'm in agreement with Mr. Marriott about making this a community thing. And um, I, I would personally like to see some more figures of, you know, not just looking at this site only. We've, we've decided that we wanna look at the site to the east, as you mentioned, Mayor. Um, why not throw some figures on that and, and compare? Because we're just looking at this one site now. It's, um, and I, I think that that would be very important. Okay, Mr. Devin, I know you were hoping to get closure on this tonight. You did not. Um, there's a little bit more work to do. So do you have any follow-up that you need from us before you? Well, I just would like it? to confirm if I can, Mr. Mayor, the, the uh, we'll, uh, we'll look at the east uh, end of the plaza site. Um, and I think that really begins with finding out if RTD would be open to a discussion about putting this structure, this um, streetcar and, and, and some sort of a shade structure there. Uh, I think before we do any extensive engineering or some yes, sort of analysis, absolutely. we have to find out if it's their, it's their side of the plaza. So we have to find out if they're open to it. If they tell us no, maybe one of you can go talk to a certain board member or whatever. Um, so, you know, I mean, we won't, necessarily take no for an answer, but we at least have to start the discussion. Um, and then um, uh, the, the other thing I heard is that if we do go back to the uh, site on Grandview, um, we need to 
look at value engineering, community involvement, and some other strategies to try to deal with the cost. Um, uh, you know, part of part of what we do in these situations is we provide you with sort of the worst case, most conservative scenario when it comes to costs, just so we can hear you uh, yell and scream at us and tell us to do better. Um, uh, so uh, we'll uh, we'll work on uh, we can work on some other alternatives there. Very good. Okay, and, and I don't even know if it'll physically fit on the east side of the plaza. I guess that would be one of the most important questions. Well, yeah, actually, that's a good point. We'll 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 kind of look at it from a siding standpoint to see if it can fit. If it can, then we'll we'll uh, talk to RTD. Very good, Mr. Marriott. Yeah, just I just wanted to add one quick thing about talking about that east side of the station platform. I, I think that physically, whether it fits and whether RTD would allow it is one. But I think the elephant in the in in that particular question is going to be the view from Grandview, which is always a contentious issue. And so we just need to think about that, that we're talking about a 15 foot tall or 20 foot tall at the peak of the roof shade structure right there at, on Grandview. So uh, looking to the south where the view is. So we should just keep that in mind if if we think we want to go down that way and, and maybe do a little talking to some of the people that would most affect before we get too far down that road. Good point, Ms. Ford. I would also um, recommend that we talk to the people in the Historical Society to get their uh, viewpoint. We've made comments about what they do and what they don't do. Um, they may have plans for programming around this trolley. And as part of it, if we, you know, I get the sense that the majority of council would like to see it on the Grandview site. I think that as part of that site, we have to plan, how do we get people down there? Um, where Are we gonna have signs to draw them? How will they know that it's there? Um, I think that that's gonna be very important because I personally don't believe that people are just gonna walk down there for the sake of the trolley. I think that you know it has to be a comprehensive, some kind of a part of a tour or something that's going to bring people there because that's not where the activity is. The activity is primarily on Old Wadsworth and uh, by the station uh, from Vance to Old Wadsworth. So let me just suggest that um, if we end up at the point of really narrowing down on the Grandview site, I would like to propose that Council Member Ford um, and the Friends of the Point 04 trolley uh, probably work with us and convene a meeting with the Historical Society. Very good. Okay, let's move on to our next workshop, please. Mr. Devin? Yes, we're going to uh, hear from uh, members of our Public Works uh, Traffic Engineering team on micro mobility and traffic calming uh, pilot programs. And I believe we are going to uh, start. Um, with uh, remarks from uh, John Feruzzi, if I'm not mistaken. If I am mistaken, Don Wick will jump in and correct me. Uh, Mr. Mayor and members of council, hello, I'm John Feruzzi. You may have not re recognized me with my uh, quarantine beard. I'm looking a little different uh, today, but uh, I'm, I'm still here. And uh, tonight we're gonna go over micromobility and traffic calming pilot programs, uh, something that uh, myself, I'm the manager of mobility and planning innovations, along with uh, Adam Lind, uh, our bicycle pedestrian coordinator, and Emily Grog from our city attorney's office will be presenting. Next. So our presentation tonight uh, is gonna cover a number of things. Um, we're gonna look at the transportation, com uh, com I'm sorry, transportation committee project overview. We're gonna discuss the first and last mile connectivity uh, project that the committee worked on, as well as their recommendations for mobility as a service or micromobility and uh, traffic calming. And then afterwards, we'll, we'll get into questions and discussion. Next. All right, so um, back in January, 2020, the chair of the transportation committee presented res their results of um, a 2019 project uh, called the First and Last Mile Project. In this project, uh, the committee evaluated connectivity to the G-Line stations. The, out of the uh, project, there were three 
recommendations that the committee recommended uh, for, for um, the city to look at. They wanted uh, the city to focus on a one mile area around the G-Line stations to encourage private sector micro mobility investment and pilot a traffic calming safety program for neighborhoods that are affected by the increase in traffic and urbanization around the G-Line station. Um, as part of that process, they discussed uh, uh, regulating the companies with a fee and permit structure, as well as collecting data and reporting on the performance to see how this would work out. Next. So as part of our effort, uh, we basically started to look at the uh, G-Line stations that are within Arvada and then one that's outside of Arvada and Wheat Ridge, but does serve uh, Arvada residents. Um, so the blue line, the dash line that you see there is kind of our um, uh, area, our zone for uh, mobility innovations and uh, specifically, the red circles that you're seeing are the actual one mile radii um, around the, the G line station. The three yellow dots or the circles that you see there is really our focus area. Uh, however, our focus is um, uh, also with working with, with our neighboring jurisdictions, given that uh, folks that are traveling in and out of the stations are not just within Arvada, but they may also be in unincorporated Adams County, Jefferson County, Denver, uh, Wheat Ridge, and, and the um, uh, neighboring areas of, around Arvada. Next. So the first part of our presentation is uh, focused on micromobility. And so um, th there are a bunch of questions that usually come up. What is micromobility? Why would we want it? Uh, well, where would it uh, operate and how will it be regulated? Um, what is the process? Uh, what, what's involved in community engagement? And what are the legal concerns? And so we're going to go over those items here on, on this uh, particular presentation. Next. So micromobility is conventional bike sharing, dockless bike sharing, e-scooters, and other small personal mobility devices, like the ones you see in this picture here. Next. So a brief history of micromobility in the Denver metro area. Um, Back in 2008, uh, B-Cycle launched their bike, uh, their bike share program in Denver. And uh, between 2008 and 2018, there wasn't a whole lot but B-Cycle. In 2018, e-scooters and dockless bikes appeared in Denver. And this is when, uh, slightly after May 2018 and June 2018, Denver created its um, one-year pilot project to regulate and manage and collect data from the uh, pilot program that uh, uh, involves scooters and, and dockless bikes. Then in May 2019, Aurora uh, set, set its rules for um, regulating um, scooters and dockless bikes. And the Colorado legislature passed a bill allowing e-scooters to operate in a roadway. So it's classified as a vehicle. Um, in September 2019, Lakewood set its rules and regulations for uh, dockless bikes and scooters. And in April 2020 now, we're wanting to present this idea to uh, Arvada and start with a pilot project. Next. So a micromobility um, uh, project would be something that is a public-private partnership. Um, we would want it because it has benefits to the user. Um, this is, you know, it, pre it presents ease of use through uh, a smartphone app, uh, it's an on-demand service, it provides point-to-point -point transportation. Um, it has benefits to uh, the city of Arvada. Um, it's low impact on infrastructure. It's a no-cost option for the city. Um, it provides a first and last mile connection to transit and something that RTD uh, advocates for. And uh, the city as, as a mobility uh, leader would want to experiment and try with not just this tool, but similar kind of mobility tools. Um, and in this particular case, micromobility um, provides a good fit for the areas around the G-Line stations, given that the average trip is one mile. Uh, and obviously in doing so, there is a benefit to the private sector as well. We would allow companies to operate and maintain the, the services that uh, they're providing for payments in, in this process. Next. Thanks, John. Um, 
I'm going to get into a few details about how this program could actually function and begin within the city of Arvada. Um, so the first step would be to create an ordinance that regulates mobility as a service, as well as an annual permitting process. Um, and you all have received our draft documents for both of those. Um, so in terms of program regulations, um, any company that operates uh, scooters, e-bikes, any of these mobility companies would be allowed to apply. And we would go through that application process, review the applications, and select the most um, viable companies for the pilot program. Uh, in the pilot program, we would limit the number of devices total between bikes and scooters to 200 per company and limit the number of companies for this pilot project. Um, and we're prepared to start with two companies to begin. Um, the program also has rules for launching, operations, parking, relocation and rebalancing, kind of everything that's involved with operating micromobility within the city. Um, these companies would be required to share data so that we would understand where the demand is for transportation, where people are coming and going from. Um, and we would also manage this program with permitting fees, penalties, and um, the option for revocation of permit if the companies are not following the rules. And the plan would be to start with a six month pilot project. Next slide. Um, so in terms of where these devices would be allowed to operate, um, in Old Town, it would follow the rules of bicycles. So no operating a scooter on the sidewalk. Um, parking would be allowed in dedicated zones in areas between the road and the sidewalk, um, but they would have to keep the sidewalk and curb ramps clear. In neighborhoods, you'd be allowed to ride on both the road and sidewalk, but parking wouldn't be allowed on sidewalk if it was less than five feet because of ADA requirements. Um, we would be encouraging people to use bike lanes and, and the city's trails for riding scooters. And in terms of streets, if there's restrictions for bicycles, it would also apply to scooters, um, for example, on Ralston Road. Next slide. Um, so we are aware of the risks and concerns that um, some people might have about starting a program like this. Um, so this slide just covers some of those options, not all of them, um, but mainly between devices being improper, improperly parked or parked in the wrong locations, um, kind of thrown all over the city. Uh, the rules require the operators to relocate, relocate those devices if they're improperly parked or in the wrong locations. Um, the city plans to potentially create dedicated parking zones, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And our permit and um, regulations are set up so that if the industry switches from scooters to something else that this same program could, could apply to those new devices. Um, next slide. So I'll turn it over to Emily to talk a little bit about the legal risks. Good evening, Council. Emily Grog with the City Attorney's Office. Um, the problem with talking about the litigation risks with um, such a new technology is that, unfortunately, the law is always quite a bit behind. Um, as this new technology emerges. There are quite a few uh, lawsuits out there. Um, none of them have really materialized to give us any good guidance on um, how the courts will eventually decide on these lawsuits. Um, we've seen a variety of different reasons that cities have been sued um, by citizens with these scooters being part of the issue. Um, the ones that are probably have the best traction in courts are the ones that cite ADA complaints. So those are ones where situations where uh, the scooters were blocking sidewalks, not making it accessible for everyone. Um, as Adam was kind of describing the last slide, we have done things in our rules and regulations to try to mitigate that um, and try to avoid situations that would arise to an ADA um, compliance issue on our sidewalks. So there's not a lot of uh, great guidance yet in the courts. Um, the cases that have gotten uh, into the court system, um, a lot of them have been remanded with the ability of the plaintiffs to uh, resubmit their um, complaints. So we just don't have good information yet, but we do know what areas that the courts are looking at. So we can put in mitigation um, to avoid any kind of lawsuit in the future. Bruce, next slide. Thanks, Emily. Um, so to touch on the parking issue, as that's the biggest one that cities here concerns from, um, on the screen, you can see a variety of different ways that cities are trying to mitigate this issue through the creation of dedicated parking zones. 
Um, so whether that's using kind of dead space on the street or using space that's in between the roadway and the sidewalk um, through bike racks and, and kind of these lighter, quicker, cheaper materials, um, we can create dedicated parking zones that would kind of help users know where they should and shouldn't uh, park these devices, whether they're bikes or scooters. Next slide. Um, so in terms of the permit fee, uh, we're recommending that we kind of follow along with what's going on in the region, um, similar to Aurora and Lakewood, that the fees would be based on fleet size and include an annual permit fee, a, p a fee per vehicle, and a small fee per ride. And the thought process here is that the more devices that are in the city, um, the more we kind of have to be aware of and manage the program. So it's going to take more time and effort, and uh, the operators should be the ones to help cover those costs. Um, so we also expect to use those fees to cover the program within the innovation zone for minor enhancements, um, such as those parking areas, intersection safety enhancements, and education programs. Next slide. Um, so the process to launch as we envision it from, from this stage, um, we are anticipating up to three public engagement events, one kind of around each G-Line station. Uh, having a Speak Up Arvada site with a survey to get feedback from residents about their interest in the program, what questions we need to answer, if they would use it, how, how beneficial it can actually be to the residents since that's the goal. Um, engage the micromobility operators to help with outreach and education, so that's not something the city is necessarily having to put all its time and energy into. Um, ordinance adoption and finalizing the regulations and permit structure and getting those approved by council. Um, implementing the preferred parking zones. And our original plan was to hopefully launch by fall. Um, now with COVID-19 and everything going on, the time frame might change for that. So we're just gonna kind of take this approach and keep moving forward and see when the best time to launch is. Uh, next slide. So our final recommendations would be that um, city council supports the regulations and permits for staff to partner with these micromobility companies and launch a pilot project allow the city and companies to deploy up to 400 devices total. So that's between bikes, e-bikes, and scooters. And again, that's split up between two operators. Um, use technology to limit that service area to the one mile radius from the transit stations, collect data, and initiate the mobility innovation zones. Um, support city staff to collaborate with our surrounding jurisdictions on future projects. And use this as an opportunity to enhance street safety for people walking, biking, and using micromobility devices through a traffic calming program. And I will turn it over to John now to talk about that. Before you do that, Ms. Miller has her hand raised. Thank you. Thank you so much for this presentation. I love all of these um, options on micro mobility. I really do. I, I'm just gonna address the same concern that I addressed back when we talked about it, I think in February. And that's the, the fact that if, you know, we ride on the bike trails all the time. We walk on the bike trails and we see a lot of these bikes and scooters just left all over the trails going down in through Denver. And I, you know, I've said several times to the people I bike with, I'm like, please don't ever let that happen in Arvada. And then when it came, you know, one of the things that was said, and originally it was one hour that they would have to return the, the bike, the bike or the scooter within one hour of reporting in our rules. Now it shows four hours but who would report them? You know, I, I think as I drive by, I don't report them. And, and several of our friends have been in really serious accidents coming around a corner and hitting one of those scooters or bikes that are laying on the side of the road that are a little bit in the trail. Just incredible, broken arms and broken faces. My brother-in-law had reconstructive surgery on his face because of hitting one of those things. Um, so I just, so my question is, is it possible, I see the reporting and all that, I think it's fantastic. Is it possible to have GPS tracking reports a little more regularly than once a month, just so that we can see if they're being left in certain places. It talks about trip usage reporting, you know, from start to finish, but we can't tell like if if that if they're being left on a trail somewhere. Um, so I just wonder if there's more extensive reporting and how can we um, monitor a little bit better the be, them being left around, or do we think it's not going to be as much of an issue because? Anybody that leaves anything in Old Town, everybody's going to hear about it. So our phones will ring off the hook. But um, it, is that the case? Or, you know, what are your thoughts on that? It's a humongous concern for me, but I do love this program so much. 
Yeah, so I think, you know, when it comes down to um, how we're going to manage this, part of our initial thinking with this is we're, we're starting out with a pilot to kind of fine tune how we're going to hold the operators responsible to maintain what they have applied for from the get-go. Our application process is rigorous to ensure that they have the capabilities to be able to respond to these kinds of issues in neighborhoods, on trails, in Old Town, and different places. And then the other half of this is also, um, you know, creating the the right kind of educational tools and places for the uh, scooters and Dockless bikes to be positioned. So we have been talking to the transportation committee a little bit about where they think we might have hot spots or you know difficult areas where we should go and invest a little bit of time in terms of figuring out where we should um, create bike parking and do some education around these kinds of things. And um, you know, it's it's kind of that push and pull uh, approach in in this context to kind of see where can we find a uh, balance between having the users understand their responsibilities when it comes to you know placing these in different locations, and then um, if it's not placed properly, what can be done through the app, the operator, and then ultimately you know in terms of rebalancing where that. Um, uh, scooter or dockless bike can, can go to uh, to be bit better used than just you know sitting for four hours. That's not to the company's benefit. That's not to the city's benefit. That's not the user's benefit. So we want to do a pilot project for that exact same reason. Mr. Pfeiffer. Uh, a couple questions. I know I thought we had some ordinances around electrical or electric e-bikes or these scooters on trails and so forth. Uh, are we have we overcome those? I can't remember. Emily, would you like to respond? Uh, Council member, are you referring to uh, some of the restrictions on where the electric assist bikes can um, travel? Is yeah. That, yeah. Um, are we in? Is this contradicting any other other ordinances that we have? So hmm. the electric scooters um, would be slightly. Well, they would be their own category. Um, the way that the state statutes have laid it out, we would actually have to uh, revise our ordinances to even allow them on public roadways. So we are kind of creating our own rules around them. Um, so it is up to the city to decide if there are further restrictions. Um, we would have an ordinance that would just directly uh, apply to users of these electric scooters. Um, the ordinance that we provided you uh, for this workshop is more surrounding the permitting structure. Um, what we'll have to do if we get guidance from you all is uh, create specific rules that will apply to the electric scooters. I believe the electric assist bikes, it's that you can't use the electric assist on the trails in certain areas. So we'll have to decide where exactly um, and if we want similar type rules on the electric scooter. Yeah, uh, because I think when you get into the education, this is going to be very difficult for our citizens to follow uh, if we have different rules on different trails and different situations. So let's try to strive for consistency. And then the other question I have is around, you know, I'm trying to picture myself getting off the G line and I'm in Old Town and I'm going to go and ride it, you know, towards City Hall. And, and let's not even say City Hall, let's just say any of the residential around there. So all of the sidewalks are probably less than three feet wide. For the most part. And so if I get to my house and I write it, I can't leave it on the street, but I don't even know if I'm supposed to or not because, you know, the, the rules. So where, where would I as a citizen take this scooter when you can't park it on any sidewalk less than five feet, which I don't know if the citizen would know that. Adam, would you like to answer this one? Yeah. Um, so our intention is that if you can park a car on the street, you would be able to leave your scooter in that same area. Um, and so when we go through that education process, we'll make it very clear that for the majority of of older neighborhoods that where we'll be launching this pilot project, that leaving it on the street is acceptable and just try and get it close to the curb um, so that it's not out in the drive aisle. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then I guess the last uh, comment or question I might have is around, I guess if it leaves a trail or something, uh, you know, I'm just trying to picture somehow it gets, you know, some kid got a hold of it and maybe destroyed it or just threw it on, you know, somewhere. I'm just trying to picture and not leaving it as I think of dots 
um, you know, concerns about somebody getting really hurt. Um, if that's the case, I mean, I, I see us holding the company uh, accountable, but four hours is a long time. And how do you know it's there? I, I just, I'm trying to think through, you know, our response, our obligation, should we go and get it? You know, how do we see it? You know, was it reported? I, let's just make sure we're very clear about just, you know, these things being laid, laid down on a trail or thrown into one of our creeks or whatever the case is, um, how we handle that and how you make it easy for people to know what, who to call and what to do with it. Sure. Yeah. Um, council member, we, we are definitely, um, you know, considering that aspect of this too, because um, where we have uh, concerns around this kind of stuff is how the operator is going to respond to the citizens' concerns or constituents' concerns. And in doing so, um, we have basically identified a, you know, two hour window uh, that we would expect the company to respond. And if they don't, then we would use, uh, you know, our code enforcement or city forces to, to go and, and uh, track down and, and deal with the um, scooter or, or bike, you know, if it's just kind of destroyed, left alone, whatever, you know, someplace. And at that point we would be uh, penalizing or, or um, you know, look at the company as tracking these issues with the company to see if they're the right company and the right fit for, for Arvada. In the process, we would also bill them for um, the city's hours, if you will, through the uh, fees and, and things that we're talking about here to, to help collect and, and um, uh, add resources to our existing resources to mitigate some of these different issues. Okay, and overall, I, I appreciate that we're, we're pursuing this. I think we should, you know, continue pursuing it. So as long as we think through a few of these things, we're good. And thank you very much, John. And it looks like you're in some other country. So hopefully the castles are taking care of you. <laughs> Actually, uh, it's a virtual background from my college in uh, Seattle, University of Washington. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So um, the next part of our presentation goes hand in hand with micromobility. It's really, um, th this is how the first and last mile discussion came about during our conversation with the transportation committee that it's not just the technology, it's not just the scooters, it's not just the dockless bikes, but we also need to do something to retrofit our streets and infrastructure and make them uh, ready for uh, the additional walking, biking, uh, and scooters and different things that, that we're talking about in relationship to the G line. And so we wanted to uh, pair that up with uh, a traffic calming program. Next slide. So um, we're gonna get into what is traffic calming? What is the connection of traffic calming to the pilot projects that we brought to you uh, in, in the fall of 2019? And what's included or excluded from, from traffic calming? Um, what are the program rules and regulations that we're proposing? And how does that work with emergency response? as well as uh, how would funding work and, and what are the ultimately the goals of a traffic calming program. Next slide. So in this particular picture, this is actually from Seattle. Um, and what you'll see here is basically a traffic circle within a intersection, as well as a speed hump uh, further be mid block between this intersection and the next intersection. And really the, the purpose here is to um, show how traffic calming would work at a uh, stop controlled intersection with ADA ramps and bicycle, um, in this case, uh, Shero treatments. Uh, basically the, the point of um, traffic calming in, in this context is other than PD and other departments in the city receiving speeding com complaints and calls, um, the traffic division itself receives about 300 Ask Arvadas almost one a day from residents wanting infrastructure like this um, to help mitigate speeding. Um, you know, speed tables, traffic circles, ball bouts, and physical features are uh, helpful in terms of uh, supporting that, that effort. And the idea here is that we would be using physical um, design elements to keep drivers at or under the speed limit and make people more comfortable walking and biking while also reducing the risk of serious crashes and reducing the volume of vehicles in some of these neighborhoods around the G-Line stations that have urbanized, um, uh, that were developed decades ago, but have changed quite a bit uh, in, in the recent years. Next slide. 
And the why around this is really related to a discussion that's happening um, nationally and regionally. There's regional uh, Vision Zero that is happening across uh, the Denver metro area. And really what it comes down to is that traffic calming is uh, the process of reducing speed. And why would we wanna reduce speed? Well, for those that are the vulnerable uh, users of a roadway, the pedestrians and cyclists, speed can really uh, play a major factor in injuries or fatalities. So you can see in this graphic here, between zero miles an hour and 20 miles an hour, uh, a crash with, between a vehicle and a pedestrian would result likely in non-severe injuries. But from 20 miles per hour to 30 miles per hour, that jumps to severe injuries. And above 30 miles an hour, we're talking usually a fatality. And that's, that's the impetus for Vision Zero and um, the idea that there'd be zero fatalities and zero um, injury crashes on the roadway network. Next slide. So in the fall of uh, 2019, we, we came to city council and presented some ideas and, and uh, uh, a pilot project basically to do uh, a couple of things that would enhance the pedestrian crosswalks in Old Town and on West 57th Avenue within a school zone. Um, the projects, the pilot projects are related to what we're talking about with traffic calming. And we got survey results from the public expressing positive and productive uh, language around what we've done. Um, so it, we wanna uh, go back to that uh, uh, intent and enhance pedestrian safety on Arvada streets. In addition to that, it would support micro mobility. So any type of um, uh, e-bikes, uh, bike shares, scooters, and other things that we introduce in addition to the existing uh, pedestrians and cyclists, this effort will, would help uh, increase safety for uh, additional um, uh, micro mobility tools that we wanna uh, introduce into neighborhoods. And in doing so, we're also preparing the uh, area along the gold line, the one mile area, if you will, as a mobility innovation zone. We're creating a permit structure and looking at how to work with uh, companies that are operate, operators of micro mobility devices and um, so essentially try to uh, uh, help fund and, and uh, bring attention to some of these locations to enhance pedestrian safety and bicycle safety. Next slide. So the where and how related to traffic calming is um, what we've been focusing on a little bit as well. Obviously, we talked about the one mile radius um, around the G-Line station. And I think a pilot program for a traffic calming program would be between a half a mile and a mile. We, we would probably start with a half a mile radius just to begin with. And what we'd wanna do is we'd wanna have a two-part approach to this. The proactive approach would be where um, it'd be city initiated. This is where uh, staff has uh, noticed through data that some streets are carrying more traffic than what the street was originally designed to carry. It's also um, uh, related to say, for example, uh, city observed safety issues. Um, if the police department or others in the city have noticed uh, a speeding issue, we can begin to take a proactive approach and also target kind of the school zones and, and different locations where it's imperative that we bring attention to um, managing speed. Part B of this is a reactive approach where we'd have a uh, opportunity for residents to initiate an investigation. And then we would start um, looking at the location where, where the issues are, are coming from and do a traffic study and work with the neighborhood residents to essentially uh, identify if a traffic calming solution is appropriate or not. Next slide. Thanks, John. Um, so in terms of traffic calming, there's kind of two different elements. Um, one is speed management, which is obviously looking at slowing down speeds. Um, and we're not looking to slow people well below the speed limit on streets throughout the city. It's really on these neighborhood streets where we have speeding issues and we're just trying to control and get people back down to that speed limit that was set for a reason. Um, the second kind is, is volume management. So as John mentioned, if a street is carrying more cars than it was originally designed to that that can cause issues and we want to find, figure out ways to kind of 
uh, push people back on the main streets where they're intended to travel on. Um, so there's other treatments that are pedestrian focused and gateway to try and change the environment. Um, and so different times, types of treatments have different varying levels of success. And there's a lot of um, different inputs that lead to deciding whether to do treatment A or treatment B. Um, but the, the other thing is that multiple treatments can be combined along a corridor. So as John showed, um, that street in Seattle had both a traffic circle and, and a speed humps. Um, next slide. And so here's just a few images of different types of both speed and volume management. Um, and as you can see, there's both horizontal deflection, which means a car driver has to move a little bit left or right, and vertical deflection, which means the vehicle would have to slow down before hitting something that's a little bit raised in the street to, to help restrict their speeds. Um, so not only do these benefit um, pedestrians and bicyclists, but also for neighborhoods, um, there's less people speeding through. It's, it's a more enjoyable and higher quality of life. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the surrounding jurisdictions, we did a look at uh, the other areas and that have traffic calming programs. Um, they all have varying rules and standards, but they're relatively similar in terms of uh, local or collector streets and some sort of speeding being identified. So we're going to use uh, preparing to create our program based on both local and national guidance. Next slide. Um, so we've developed a few pilot program principles. We haven't completely finalized the rules yet, um, but limit traffic calming programs to local and collector streets. Uh, we have to identify that the 85th percentile speed was a certain mile per hour over the speed limit. Um, as John mentioned, average daily traffic could be greater than the roadway classification. Um, we wouldn't require cost sharing for neighborhoods to maintain equal access to everybody in the city. Um, these traffic calming programs plans would require neighborhood support and for permanent concrete investments those would remain permanent meaning we wouldn't go back and take them out in a year because people started complaining and if we decided to do a more temporary uh, treatment whether that's modular or paint and flex post um, we would want those to stay for a year so that we could collect data and then have a good time frame to make an evaluation uh, next slide so the next slides are kind of going to show all of the streets and, and narrow down to the amount of streets that are actually going to be included in this proposed pilot project. Um, so as you can see, we go from all of the streets down to local and collectors within that mobility innovation district. And so this is really where we're going to target the program. And if it's successful, we would then expand it to other areas of the city. But this is kind of the, the focus area for this first phase. Next slide. Um, so in terms of emergency service coordination, that's always one of the big questions that we get. Um, we've met with both, both police and fire department to talk about why we're doing this, how it would be implemented, uh, different kinds of treatments, and have coordinated with them about which ones would work, what wouldn't work, how we develop these, and we plan to continue to include them uh, throughout the pilot project to get responses and to be coordinating with the design treatments as we develop these um, on specific streets. So as you can see here, this is kind of a design that was put in so that fire trucks or, or wider axle vehicles can go through without having to slow down and hit the speed humps, but your normal car or truck would have to slow down uh, before hitting these. So next slide. Um, so in terms of funding, our original plan was looking at uh, $250,000 annually for a combination of quick builds and full concrete construction. Um, we understand that we're in new economic times and are working through our budget pr process um, to identify what we think is, is more reasonable. Um, so you can see here the top right picture is a concept that we have. This is at Brooks Drive in West 59th Place where the Ralston Creek Trail um, kind of turns into the road, the trail ends and either you're walking on the sidewalk or biking in the street. Um, so this is a treatment for everybody to kind of handle that intersection a little bit better. And also for drivers, it kind of helps you realize you're going into a different area um, and to be more aware of the potential for bikers and walkers in this area. Um, and then at the bottom, you can see it's kind of just a comparison of the different types of treatments. What we did on West 57th is that lighter, quicker, cheaper with flex posts and paint. Um, modular there is kind of like a rubberized treatment for speed humps. And then concrete there on that raised uh, crosswalk is the most permanent and effective measure. Next slide. 
Um, so to kind of summarize, the goals of this program are to increase bicycle, scooter, and pedestrian safety and comfort, especially in conjunction with micromobility and access to those G-line stations, improve the quality of life for residents by reducing speeding and higher traffic volumes in neighborhoods, increase safety for children walking and bicycling to school, uh, reduce the risk of severe crashes by reducing speeding, and to limit or reduce cut through traffic on neighborhood streets. Next slide. So I just wanna thank you for your time tonight and we'll be happy to answer any questions, concerns, comments. Hey, any questions from council? Ms. Miller. I just wanna say great job. I think this is fantastic. I'm excited about it. And I've, I've heard from other communities that it works. So great job guys. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Marriott, you're next. Yeah, thank you. I have a question for our staff members. The uh, um, What are the lessons we learned from the pilot program we've done over the last six or eight months? Can you be just a little bit more specific about some of the things that were that were good and right with it and some of the things that were wrong with it? Because I don't expect it was 100% home run all the way. So can you let us know kind of what some of the ups and downs were? Sure, um, I'll maybe kick it off and then hand it over to Adam to, to add some information. Um, so as part of our process, we did quite a bit of uh, planning around this just to kind of make sure to take our time and, and understand the environment that we're, we're getting into. Um, we looked at the timing of this with, um, uh, it was around the holidays. And so we wanted to make sure to uh, have discussions with school and uh, school staff along uh, West 57th Avenue and in our K-8 have discussion with um, Old Town um, Business Improvement District around the proposal there. And, and so we did uh, some, some things, I think, pretty, pretty good in, in terms of communication and um, uh, showing concepts and bringing those ideas forward. Um, where I think uh, we were gonna you know, try this out. And unfortunately with the COVID-19 situation, we got limited data and we weren't able to uh, we, we did some before data, but we haven't done quite a bit of after data since. And um, in terms of keeping track of, you know, how people are reacting, we've got survey information uh, that's uh, mostly good. Uh, in some cases, there's some feedback that that is concerning, and we're looking into that, as well as um, some information related to kind of the maintenance of, of the devices when uh, they get struck. Adam, do you have anything to add? Uh, sure. I mean, I, th I think like John mentioned, we did have a lot of positive feedback um, on West 57th. A lot of the comments were related to um, people actually turning slower through those areas, which was the intent. Um, so that was good. A few people are just are not fans of the aesthetics of it. Um, a lot of people had we had I think we had a question that do you want it to remain with flex posts or would you like to see them made permanent with concrete? And a lot of people want to see that those devices made permanent. Um, so there is a big financial hit if we if we went forward with that um, in Old Town. I think again we had mainly positive experience. I mean, I've got a question here before or after the improvements. Um, let's see here it says before or after. If you were walking, which design makes you feel more comfortable? Uh, Forty-eight people said after. Nine said before. Um, we did get some feedback from business community that it was a little bit rough for. Some of the delivery trucks coming through and making those turns. Um, so one of the treatments that we're looking at now is actually changing out some of those planters in Old Town to kind of handle that um, turning movements to make those easier for the trucks coming through. Um, but we didn't really have any, I personally, and I don't think John, our department had received any major calls or people having major issues um, with with the proposed improvements that we implemented. Ms. Ford? Oh, Mark, may I follow that up real quick? I'm sorry. Quickly. Okay, sure. I'll be real quick. So I just want to give you my, a couple of my quick observations. The the 57th and car, I know the, the 72 bus runs over those corner posts every time they make a turn. So I don't know if we've looked at, you know, was the size of those appropriate? Should they have been smaller? Should they have been shaped different or not? And I don't know if there's any lessons learned there. And then the other one is that in, in Old Town, and I realized that was a temporary pilot program but but uh, the thing i've heard mostly from folks is the aesthetics of it is, is a little bit grim um that that you know if we were to 
we were to model that after something, hopefully we would uh, come up with something a little bit, a little bit better than that, or at least use that as a lessons learned. So that's it. I'll just make those two comments and, and Mr. Mayor, you can move on. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, in, in regards to the bus, um, we are definitely, when we put those in more permanent, going to realign that intersection to make sure that the bus can make that turn now. So that is definitely yep. a lesson learned. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Good. Ms. Ford? Uh, John, I, I just wanted to ask you, do you think that the uh, permit fees uh, would cover some of the costs for the calming measures and um, parking zones? Or whoever would like to answer that question. Yeah. So I think, you know, we, we would definitely have um, a small pool of, of money through the fees that, that are being collected um, to help with some of the issues that we heard from Council Member May, uh, Miller earlier, you know, related to rebalancing, making sure that the, the major issues are not happening and, and that we're able to uh, keep track of the devices and, and they're not just being trashed. Um, in terms of traffic calming, um, we're asking and, and look going through the budget process right now and, and, and looking to see if we can get additional dollars given that it's uh, more expensive to do these uh, retrofit treatments to the infrastructure than what a um, uh, fee could cover. So we anticipate somewhere around $20,000 a year um, in terms of uh, permit fee, fee per ride and, and that kind of thing, you know, from, from the 400 or so um, uh, scooters and DACA spikes. But $20,000 a year doesn't really give us much in terms of traffic calming. So we'd have to look for a different re um, funding source for that. Okay. Yeah, and I would, I would just add that in terms of the, the parking zones, that those fees could definitely cover parking zones and additional kind of outreach um, because we're talking about bike racks, which are like $100 a piece. So that part of it, we can handle paint, the lighter, quicker, cheaper, but getting into modular or permanent for traffic calming, that's definitely going to need an additional funding source. Okay, thanks. Okay. I see no other questions. Mr. Devin, how long do we need for the Arvada Hub parking study? How long do we need? Uh, yes, I would, sir. I would, say, I would say approximately 30 minutes or so. Um, uh, I, Don or I, I think John Ferruzzi, are you gonna be, John, you're gonna be making that presentation? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, probably 20 to uh, 30 minutes. My, my only comment is anytime you ask an engineer what time it is, they tell you how to build a clock. And so uh, to the extent we can move this along, I think it would be nice. Uh, sure. Um, Mr. Mayor, before we leave that, though, um, I think uh, we, I just want to check in terms of next steps on, on the micro mobility and traffic calming programs. I think we have. I, I think we've at least received feedback from you that suggests we can um, continue to, uh, to to work on this and maybe uh, present a, uh, a plan of some sort to you in the future or, or check in with you. Uh, in other words, continue uh, with the progress that, uh, that we've made today. Can I see thumbs up? You've okay. got thumbs up. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you to John and to Adam. Yes, thank you both. Okay, we'll move on to the Old Town Arvada Hub Parking Study. Mr. Devin. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, the uh, what's before you tonight is uh, the parking study results from um, the Old Town Transit Hub uh, Parking Study. This is really a, a lead in to uh, potential future steps that we would take to manage parking demand in the Old Town Transit Hub, and uh, also uh, something that is necessary for the MOU, um, I'm sorry, for the IGA Intergovernmental Agreement with RTD. And again, I believe John is going to lead off this presentation. So uh, John, take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor and members of council, um, again, I'm John Ferruzzi with the uh, Mobility and Planning Innovations Division of Public Works. Um, I have with me Derek Fern. He's our Travel Demand Management and Parking Coordinator, uh, recently hired and uh, uh, new staff member on, on my team, as well as uh, Andrew Vidor, our Parking Consultant from Walker Consulting uh, as part of this presentation. Next slide.
So before Andrew uh, jumps in uh, to, to kind of get into this, I just want to preface this with um, uh, a little bit of history. Uh, in, in 2010, uh, 2009, 2010, the city went through a process to essentially review parking in Old Town. At that time, uh, we reviewed Old Town and vicinity to see how many parking spaces are available, like the total inventory, and uh, went through an extensive process with uh, consultants to identify steps that would help us get to the G-Line and then after the G-Line into paid parking and, and kind of managing uh, demand. At that time, uh, we basically went through uh, the, the inventory, which yielded 7,700 some parking spaces in both private and public um, uh, areas of Old Town. And uh, we basically started to look a little bit about, we looked at uh, the time periods where um, uh, we're having peak periods and where these peaks were happening. Then later in 2016, with the uh, G Line and the Transit Hub coming online, we uh, uh, went back and, and rechecked our homework at that time to see uh, what we've completed so far, what our next steps look like. And uh, at that point, uh, Andrew and his team uh, went through another study uh, in, of the Old Town area and looked specifically at um, how we we're going to accomplish our next steps uh, related to the Transit Hub. And most recently, um, since we have a, memo, a, a memorandum of understanding, an MOU with RTD, uh, and we've been collecting data in the transit hub and working with them towards an IGA, um, the goal is to, uh, when this MOU expires in September, to have an IGA ready to go that we would, uh, would replace the MOU. And that process would help uh, 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 get us to managing the parking demand in a more efficient manner in the transit hub. And so with that, I will let Andrew take take on the, the next set of slides to kind of go through what we've discovered during our study. Thanks, John, I appreciate it. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members, city leadership and city staff. I'm Andrew Vador, I'm a director of planning operations and technology here at Walker Consultants. I'm located in our Denver office where we've been here since 1981. Uh, happy to be here with you this evening and excited to be working on this project again. Uh, these are the topics we'll go through this uh, in the next 20 minutes or so. If we go to the next slide, please, Bruce. Parking management is incredibly important, and I want to start by sharing a couple of reasons why that is. Uh, Arvada is a very desirable place to go, not only for those shopping and dining, but for those getting on the G-Line, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. But equity for all is important. And equity for all means all of the different parkers that are gonna be using the parking assets, not only in Old Town, but the hub parking garage itself. That's gonna include business owners, employees, people shopping and dining in downtown at the Old Town, as well as riders of the RTD transit system, whether that's the rail or the bus lines. Parking also provides good economic growth incentives. And when managed properly, economic growth can thrive as a result of good managed parking. In a lot of ways, the parking operation uh, can help fund the parking system if parking fees or parking permits are in place. Good parking management principles reduce cruising. Cruising is referred to the idea of vehicles driving around in circles looking for the closest and nearest parking space. Good parking management will help us find our parking quicker and easier, which ultimately is going to improve the customer experience. In the case of the hub, it absolutely imports the incentivization of transit use. Now that the G-Line's open, ridership and transit use from that garage has increased significantly. And ultimately, John talked about, we looked at this in 2016, and then it was previously looked about uh, around 2009. Growth in the front range is requiring different changes in parking management that were even required three years ago. Next slide, please, Bruce. The goals of managing parking can be done with the varying number of strategies. These are all different strategies that are available uh, that are commonly used in the front range. Not all of them are appropriate necessarily for Old Town, but uh, paid parking is one strategy that's effective in managing parking. Time limits to help encourage turnover of on-street parking and provide the long-term parking resources 
off street is another important strategy. Travel demand management strategies, such as the previous discussion that John and Adam had with you about micro mobility, helps reduce people getting in their car for those first and last mile trips. And then identifying where parkers can park based on who they are. So for example, if you're an all day parker, you're gonna to wanna to park off street, you know, potentially in the hub versus the lots in town. Next slide, please. The goals of this study are to understand the strategies that were identified in 2016, which were implemented and which weren't and why not. Uh, understand how the hub garage is being utilized since the G-Line opened in 2019. That includes the parking utilization for RTV parkers as well as the city parkers. Peer benchmark, uh, which is an important strategy you saw earlier this evening with some other municipal agencies that jointly operate parking with RTD in the front range, and then identify what changes are necessary to the parking management strategies so we can continue to serve not only the needs of the Old Town patrons, but the users of RTD as well. Next slide, please. We can move one more, please. So there's a number of strategies that were not implemented since 2016. Uh, I will say these three strategies uh, were not implemented because no one wanted to. They specifically ha have reasons for them. Uh, one is the development of the IGA. Obviously that MOU is in place now. And as of September, it's the intent to have an IGA in place. The other two uh, focus on long-term parking, which have been addressed on a very case-by-case -case basis with not only the Arvada Police Department, but RTD as well. Next slide, please. In 2016, we looked at a number of trigger points that we might want to consider as to when paid parking could be appropriate for Old Town. We believe that paid parking is appropriate uh, under a number of conditions specifically for Old Town. One is when your on-street parking regularly exceeds 85% occupancy. That currently is the case in Old, Town, in Old Town and has been monitored since last parking was brought on board as a result of the 2016 parking study. Last parking is the town's current parking operator. Uh, the other item is specifically related to the RTD parking spaces. So of the 600 parking spaces that are in the hub garage, 400 are allocated to RTD. When those spaces, uh, average utilization is above 85% occupancy, we understand that there will likely be spillover of additional RTD parkers into the 200 spaces that are available to city parkers. That currently is the case. Uh, we're nearing 85% occupancy, though I will say on most days, we are not exceeding 85% occupancy. So we're getting really close to that uh, period in time where that occurs. And then lastly, when it becomes commonplace, either immediately adjacent to the um, station here in Old Town, but other stations in the front range moving to a paid parking model, it's not commonplace today. It's starting to move that direction, though the only actual other station that charges for parking currently is the Isla Station in the city of Aurora. Next slide, please. And we'll talk about the existing conditions. Um, this information is for the weekday parking utilization in the hub. We're not going to get into too much detail on this, but a couple of key takeaways that's important is currently uh, garage wide of those 600 spaces, about 375 of them are occupied during the weekday. It's about 63% utilization. That leaves about 225 spaces available on most given weekdays um, to accommodate additional vehicles. The table here on the bottom shows the distribution of RTD parkers versus public parkers. Um, in that utilization, you see the predominant amount of those parkers um, in Teal or Cyan is occupied by RTD parkers. Uh, the RTD spaces themselves, I mentioned, um, are operating at about 85% of their 400 space capacity. So that's one of those uh, key takeaway points that we want to watch for. This data was generated between August and December of 2019 once the G-Line opened. 
On the next slide, we'll show some statistics specific to the weekend demand. You'll see that demand on the weekend goes down quite a bit. Uh, only about 20% utilization, leaving a, an abundant amount of parking available in the hub. Now that has largely to do with the typical weekday commuter use of RTD users, both for rail and bus. So during the weekend, there's adequate and abundant uh, parking availability in the hub garage. Next slide, please. This figure on the top shows that uh, since the G-Line opened in August, the number of RTD spaces that are occupied for greater than 24 hours is decreasing. Now that's important for two reasons. One, it shows that the education of parkers um, that the city is working with uh, both on the city level as well as uh, with your parking operator, Laz, is working in that teaching people the rules of the road, so to speak, is working. It also has to do with more increased enforcement. The uh, table on the bottom shows some statistics about daily parking and length of stay within the hub garage. The length of stay is actually increasing, suggesting that possibly RTD parkers are parking for um, all day, you know, uh, not just for a couple hours. Next slide, please. This figure here on the left shows compliance with parkers registering for their parking session. While it's currently free, registration is still required. Uh, registering between both the application on their smartphones that are available and the kiosks that are in the garage. This line trending downward since the G line opened is a good thing. It shows that compliance of parkers actually registering. Uh, effectively is working. Again, that goes to show that education and outreach to those parkers is effective. Next slide, please. We want to talk about some peer benchmarking. I don't want to go into the details of this because there's a lot of information for you to digest at a later date, but the column uh, on, the, on the left there, the first column is the number of the stations that operate similar to Old Town Arvada's hub garage. Those are either city or town run facilities that access is provided to for RTD, either both in rail and bus or a combination of both. Um, what we do look at in this table is who owns and operates them, but also the fees that are charged. And this has to do with rate analysis and the rate structures. Currently parking in Old Town is free um, as well as it is in the hub. I mentioned earlier that ILIF station is the only station in the immediate front range that charges for parking. It currently charges $2 a day. The only other parking for stations that have access to RTD parking is parking in excess of 24 hours, and there's a $2 a day cost for in-district parkers. Boulder Junction is the exception. RTD parkers can park for free, however, Boulder Junction is a private facility and provides access to a transient parkers, to daily customers as well as public or private parking. So there is a fee for that. Next slide, please. Uh, Want to benchmark RTD ridership, and this is important because it gives us an understanding of how the Old Town Station is performing in comparison to some of those other peer. Uh, organizations. There's two things that I think are important to take away here. If you take the I-25 and Broadway station out of the mix, which is the row on the top, that's the largest boarding station anywhere in the front range because it has the most lines that are accessed both in terms of rail and in terms of bus access. But Old Town is operating uh, with the second most riders uh, with the exception of I-25 and Broadway. And I think that's really cool because it shows that since the G-Line came online for customer access in August of 2019, the ridership, not only between the G-Line, but the bus ridership, you know, continues to be pretty high. So I think this is why it's so exciting to be talking about this is because Old Town will be thriving as a result of having all these additional riders coming to Old Town, not only to start and originate their trip, 
on transit, but to access the businesses in Old Town either before or after. Next slide, please. This is just another uh, figure on the top that shows uh, ridership splits from the different stations that we evaluated. What's important here, the table at the bottom, this is some benchmarking data and this benchmarking data looks at the number of vehicles parked in the hub garage compared to the boardings. And that ratio on the far right column of 0 0.21, 0 0.19 and 0.36 is really low. And the reason that's so low is because a lot of the people that are using the transit access are not driving their vehicle to park in the hub. They're coming from some other form of mobility, whether it's walking, being dropped off, riding their bike. Uh, if micro mobility is rolled out in Old Town, that's likely to increase. This means that there is still additional access available from the parking perspective to support continued growth in Old Town and particularly at the hub. Next slide, please. We have a number of recommendations that we have identified for uh, completion prior to the adoption of the IGA with the town and with the um, RTD. And these are focused on primarily low hanging fruit, if you will. Uh, there's nothing to stop us from doing this today. It focuses on collecting additional data. So we have additional benchmark information that we can come back to as we evaluate the IGA. And it also has some additional recommendations to help improve the customer experience and any confusion there might be as related to signage. And again, you know, the idea of educating parkers on the policies now and as policies change is important because we've shown data-driven metrics that the city is doing in order to help facilitate good rule following. So we congratulate you for doing that. Um, the next slide focuses on some potential rate structures for paid parking. What's really important here is that if the city and Old Town move to paid parking, we can't do it for the hub garage alone. It needs to be district wide in Old Town. The reason is if parking goes to paid in the hub and not in Old Town, the long-term factors vis-a-vis -vis RTD transit riders are likely to park in those most desirable spaces in the city lots and on street all day as a way to avoid fees. We've looked at flat daily fees and flat daily rates. So one fee to park either for an hour or all day as well as hourly rates. We understand that RTD riders are most sensitive and pricing structures have a lot of elasticity as it relates to that. And we need to be careful about pricing strategies as to not push parkers uh, to other stations, which the most immediate stations are the Gold Strike and Arvada Ridge. But also we need to be uh, sensitive to the pricing strategies for those all day parkers that would be parking in the hub garage or in Old Town altogether as it relates to business owners and employees being charged unreasonable rates. So we're understanding and sensitive to those issues. Next slide. Our recommendation is to go with a gateless system. So currently that parking structure does not have any access restriction points. We recommend initially a flat $2 a day rate why is that? It's because it's consistent with other rates that are similar to the peer benchmark communities. It's currently the same rate as the ILIF station in Aurora. It's also consistent with the over 24 hour length of stay rate for in-district users, uh, for other RTD facilities. It also allows us to be able to manage the price elasticity for all of the other Parker users that are not RTD Parkers being conscious of any rate challenges that have to do with employees or business owners downtown. Next slide, please. This is a similar table that I showed you previously, but these are specific metrics and recommendations as well as target points and data-driven decision points that we recommend the city include 
in the IGA with RTD. It focuses on how and when to change pricing structures. It talks about how and when monitoring occurs in terms of utilization. And it talks about how we can move to a uniformed parking system where it's not city parkers and RTD parkers, but just a parker uh, in order to enhance the overall parkers experience. So a lot of these recommendations and uh, policy points are currently in the draft IGA that the city and RTD are working through. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll close here with next steps and discussion from John, as well as any questions. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to present, and hopefully I didn't create a watch and kept us on time. Thank you, Andrew. You did, you did good, but you've got to learn how to pronounce Arvada. Mr. Devitt is laughing hysterically. I was born in Aurora, so it's not my fault. <laughs> So Welcome I, aboard. I, I just want to add uh, that as part of this process, we're currently um, in discussion with, with RTD that a draft IGA has been established that's being reviewed by the legal teams on both sides, that the scope or the deal points of that IGA has gone to the RTD board. It went to their uh, April 7th uh, board meeting and that it's going to come up again in June, on, I think on June 2nd at their next board meeting. And as part of the process, we're following the recommendations from um, the uh, parking experts on this to make sure that we're in line with the rates and the um, uh, strategies of RTD stations across the Denver region so that the user has the best experience at the end of the day. This really isn't about RTD users versus City of Arvada. They're all customers to us. And that's how we're looking at this to make sure that we have a great customer experience for the user at the end of the day. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Devin, is there any council members got any comments, questions? Okay, Mr. Marriott. Yeah, so the only, the comment I would have is, is that I would like to see us, I know we initiated this study ahead of time, but I think the, uh, our current times may be changing the situation and, and I predict changing the situation for a really long time. Um, I know uh, there are a number of uh, businesses who are moving out of their office space in downtown Denver and uh, people I think will have a long time before they're comfortable getting into a crowded train to, to uh, commute to, to downtown. And so I think the whole paradigm may have had a big shift here. And so for that reason, I would encourage us to, uh, to proceed cautiously with any kind of a plan to to, to dramatically change the uh, any of the parking uh, rules or issues or anything around Old Town and particularly charging for parking for a, for a good long time until we really see how things change back and if they do, um, uh, you know. So this seems like something that I don't know for for it's working really well the way it is. There's not a problem to solve here that at least for the next year we need to probably just keep our eyes on. Ms. Simpson? Um, I agree with the sentiments expressed by Councilmember Marriott, and I also want to express my own hesitation with introducing uh, paid parking um, for the hub in particular because this was something that was uh, promised to the voters uh, and the citizens when it came that it was going to be free. And so there's sort of a, a sentiment that we could be pulling the rug out from under them. You know, it was going to be free, it's going to be free, and now suddenly it's not. Um, in particular, in light of the fact that all of the other stations in the area are currently still operating free, people might choose to use other stations, which is great, but I, I don't know um, if that would be to our disadvantage then in Old Town, and we, we might be losing more than we gain or, or cutting our gains, uh, so to speak. 
Uh, on that note, though, I do really like the idea of the 24-hour parking over that. I think that that could be a way to capture perhaps some of the airport parking um, once it uh, resumes and people begin traveling via air again. So uh, a fee for the hub for over 24 hours, I think, could perhaps be a really good um, transitional uh, middle step uh, before going all the way to charging people who commute downtown or people who work in Old Town all day long and have to park their cars in the garage. Ms. Ford. Uh, just a couple of thoughts that I had while reading the material. Um, I, I would be uncomfortable uh, with a fee for 24 hours. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with anyone parking for more than for 24 hours or more, given that we may have a, a complex coming in where it's possible that there may be overflow of parking and I wouldn't want uh, residents taking advantage of that. Um, the other thing that I was a little concerned about was, was the idea of the hub rate uh, being a little lower than the rate for Old Town uh, public parking, because uh, I'm thinking that people with disabilities uh, may want to park closer to the stores, <clears throat> excuse me, and they would be charged more uh, to do that. And then I also agree with uh, council members Marriott and Simpson. I don't think that right now is the time to uh, create a charge for parking. I think that we wanna do all that we can to drive business to Old Town and not thwart it. May I uh, provide a clarification real quick? Yes, um, please. So, so as part of our process, what we're trying to do is we have to come up to an IGA with, with RTD. And even though um, uh, our MOU currently is in effect and it has some operational um, uh, guidance on, on what to do, what we want to do is we want to come to a shared parking agreement to make the best and most efficient use of the 600 spaces. And that's kind of part of why we look at the data so carefully. And then establish thresholds to manage that capacity to the, uh, in, in conjunction with all the other kind of stations along the uh, G line. So um, yes, if demand is soft and it's likely going to be uh, you know, coming out of the COVID situation, that then we wouldn't meet the thresholds for paid parking. It would be free at that point. However, once that demand starts to build up, we have the IGA and structure in place that would let us basically, without uh, having to go to RTD constantly, manage that capacity and begin to use a nominal fee to manage parking uh, based on those trigger points. So once we hit 85% in the garage, for example, that's a trigger point to go to two dollars, you know, and and that fee is nominal with and in line with all the other kind of stations. The way we're going to um, look at Old Town is a little bit different and separate from this, but also connected to it. Um, the idea here is definitely to make to make the best and most efficient use of the transit hub, and if somebody's planning to park long term, that's where the fee would prevent them from parking long term. And we've also kind of uh, worked that into the, the IGA as well to, to make sure that we're encouraging people to use it for it's as efficient as possible. Ms. Miller. Thank you. I just wanted to agree with council member Marriott and you know, thank you, John, for um, those extra comments. I, I do, I, I also think that we shouldn't discourage people from long-term parking mostly because we have been encouraging folks from the beginning to be able to ride into Old Town and take the G line to the airport. And if they're flying a trip, then they're not, you can't go for a week long stay and, and, you know, have your car parked in the hub. So that's just something I want to keep in mind. I know Ranger, you know, wanted to do that for the longest time, but we thought, you know, he couldn't park there for four or five days. So I just would, I would encourage us to look look past that 24 hour rule for those that that do want to take the airport or take the G line out to the airport. I agree with those sentiments.
Mr. Mayor, you're muted. Ms. Board, did you have something else? Uh, yes, I just wanted to clarify a statement that was made that, um, and, and I don't know if I can repeat the statement, but I'm wondering, have we looked at whether or not a lot of people are parking at the ward station and then going through the old town station? Uh, because it seemed to me, I, I recall that we had a problem with the parking there, that it was really starting to overflow. Can you, can you just speak to that, John? Yeah, sure. Um, so the ward station uh, has been at capacity since uh, the G line uh, started running. It's it's the end of line station and uh, brings in quite a bit of you know demand from uh, the areas west of um, uh, Old Town and West Arvada. Um, so as part of the process, it's not within the city of Arvada per se, and and we've been keeping in touch with our colleagues in Wheat Ridge about this, kind of tracking it. Um, as part of that process, what we're aware of is that they're working with RTD on expanding the parking lots. That was part of their phase one, phase two kind of approach. They have a site identified the, um, you know, the next step is once they meet, meet their trigger point that they would have a parking lot expansion uh, project at that location. Now, um, that is an RTD owned lot and it's not a parking structure. So it's a little bit different for the customers in, in the sense that, um, you know, there, there are, uh, there's the Arvada Ridge Station, for example, next on the line and, and that has been um, lesser in, in demand. Um, our demand, at least the information that we've been studying uh, for, for the transit hub, shows that um, we have. Uh, quite a few commuters. So you saw the 85% occupancy for, for the 400 um, uh, RTD spaces, but quite a bit of capacity from the city uh, uh, parking spaces. And so our goal is to um, really look at the system overall, but compare ourselves in, in terms of ridership, in terms of location to comparable um, uh, park and rides in the metro area, and then, and then gauge ourselves based on that. So uh, we did not compare uh, ourselves quite a bit as, as much to, to Ward Road Station. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Mr. Devin, do you need further direction from council? It sounds like there's sort of a sentiment to, because of world events that um, this may not move as quickly as we thought it might, but uh, it makes sense to go ahead and have everything in place for when the world comes back to reality, whenever that point may be. Yes, I, I believe you're, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, that's what, that's what I think our team um, gathered from the council comments. I think John Fruzzi said it very well when he talked about the trigger points. This is going to be a data-driven decision. And, and if the trigger points show uh, that parking demand is soft because of the economic impact of what's happened, then obviously we're not going to, um, uh, implement something that would, um, uh, you know, be be counterproductive. Uh, I believe there is a, an expectation that we complete the IGA uh, sometime uh, by the approximately the third quarter or so of this year. I believe that's the track that we're on with with RTD. You know, certainly we'll keep you informed as we um, as we bring this forward. Um, and um, again, because of the trigger points, I, I, I you know paid parking is, is likely not going to be something that's going to occur very quickly. I do want to remind the council that, that um, and, and some of you that are new, uh, uh, we, we envision that at some point in time, we would need to uh, implement some sort of paid parking in this facility um, for a number of reasons. Parking demand is one of them. Also to recover uh, at least some of our annual operating costs uh, for the uh, management and operation of the hub. We have to clean it, we have to uh, maintain it, uh, we have to do certain things, we have to, you know, we have to manage the, the, the uh, parking enforcement program. You know, all of those things right now are, are essentially an unrecovered cost. Some of that we envision getting recovered eventually, not maybe now, but eventually uh, with the implementation of parking fees. So I, I just wanna remind council that that was something that uh, we, we envisioned when we built the hub. Very good, I see no other questions. I would remind council members to take your uh, binders 
and put them outside tonight so that uh, city clerk's office can get them picked up. They're, they're out of binders. And uh, Kristen Rush told me if they don't have binders, they're gonna cancel future meetings. So, uh, uh, so Mr. Devin, you'll know whether or not we wanna keep meeting by whether or not we return our binders. But uh, uh, good discussion, everybody. Um, I'll, I'll take responsibility for having three uh, study items workshops tonight because I think I was the one pushing to keep us busy. Three pretty heavy topics and uh, um, lengthy discussions, but important discussions. So with that, we are, Mr. Devin, anything else you've got? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>